In 1991, Britain was part of a coalition that went to war with Iraq. But how and why did that first Gulf War happen? Saddam Hussein had invaded the tiny oil-rich Gulf state of Kuwait on the 2nd of August, 1990. International outrage followed, and fear. If Saudi Arabia was next, the Iraqi dictator would control more than half the world's oil. The response was rapid. Within a week, US fighter jets had arrived in the Gulf, followed by the Royal Air Force. US forces called it Desert Storm, the British Operation Granby. The first Gulf War was fought by a colossal American-led alliance. 39 countries took part, supplying 670,000 troops, 470,000 from the US and more than 53,000 from the UK. My 30-year-old self was there to witness at least some of it. Here in the Gulf, hundreds of British troops continue to pour in each day. It's the biggest build-up of military hardware since the Second World War. By October 1990, 7th Armoured Brigade had left Germany for Saudi Arabia. Cameras greeted the arrival of Challenger tanks. This was to be the first big televised conflict. The Desert Rats would be joined by a second British Army of the Rhine Brigade. The peaceful solution would be for Iraq to get out of Kuwait. That is a matter for them. We hope they will do it. If not, we shall have to take the military option and see that Iraq does leave Kuwait. A war never fought against the Russians was about to be played out in Iraq. Tanks now specially adapted for the desert dust trained for weeks. But the number one concern was an Iraqi chemical and biological attack. For months, soldiers had to take nerve agent protection pills. Anthrax and plague vaccinations were part of a cocktail of injections. This was later blamed for a set of conditions that became known collectively as Gulf War Syndrome. When the war started, it was from the air. Saddam Hussein had ignored a United Nations ultimatum, and the response was rapid. Five months ago, Saddam Hussein started this cruel war against Kuwait. Tonight, the battle has been joined. It was the first smart bomb conflict. Tomahawk cruise missiles rained down on Iraq and the capital Baghdad. Laser-guided bombs from radar-defying F-117 stealth planes pierced hardened bunkers. The Iraqis tried to respond with notoriously inaccurate Scud missiles. For 42 days and 42 nights, air bases, bridges and enemy positions were struck. Okay, okay, Sorry, right one, going left. Royal Air Force tornadoes would fly two and a half thousand sorties. Of the 55 Allied aircraft lost, eight were British. Very sadly, we have lost uh, further tornado GR1. The Royal Artillery complemented the air campaign. From inside Saudi Arabia, the big guns pounded Iraqi forces across the border. Everything was now set for the ground war. It's now quarter past two on the 25th of February, just going through the berm into Iraq. Once we crossed the start line, you didn't know what was going to come next. We're constantly on the move, and the majority of the men on the first attack were all hyped up, sitting in the back, bright as buttons, waiting to go. The most important thing was to actually get through the American breach. We were concerned that that large concentration would be a chemical target. As soon as we cleared the breach, then, then you, you pre present a much smaller target and a much less likely chemical target. The main threat, more or less, was waiting on a missile coming into the side of the vehicle to take out the whole section. 1st Battalion, the Royal Scots mission, was to destroy an Iraqi battalion. As they knocked out tanks and personnel carriers, something became clear. Resistance was uncoordinated, and enemy soldiers seemed to be deserting. 
British casualties weren't pouring into the regimental aid post either. They were overwhelmingly Iraqi. A short but successful ground war was about to end. Exhausted and hungry Iraqi soldiers had had enough. They were now rapidly surrendering and in greater numbers than anticipated. It takes a lot of time to disarm them. We were supposed to be taking 50 of them. They were walking towards us and we actually had to leave without them because we just were running out of time. It is very time consuming. Maybe it's one of the ways of slowing an army down, is it just give them lots and lots of prisoners of water handle. Iraqi POWs would eventually number close to 80,000. As Saddam's forces stared defeat in the face, they began to retreat from Kuwait. They also launched a scorched earth policy and started the biggest oil fire the world had ever known. More than 650 wells were set ablaze. You can see on every horizon, fire and smoke as these oil wells burn themselves out. In some instances, the fires have gone out and pure oil is gushing out of the ground. The smoke from these fires, when they pour over Kuwait City, darken the sun and produce a smog that totally blackens the sky. It's a pleasant day today, but downwind from where we are now, it simply looks as though storm clouds have gathered. It really is truly an awe-inspiring sight. Once Kuwait had been liberated, it would take a further eight months to put the fires out. 5% of the Kuwaiti landscape had been contaminated. And 30 years after the first Gulf War, the cleanup operation is still going. But the apocalyptic vision of oil fires wasn't all that depicted the Iraqi flight from Kuwait. In the final hours of the conflict, fleeing Iraqi troops had reached Mutla on the road to Basra. It would come to be known as the Highway of Death. Strewn across the Iraqis' original invasion route was all that was left of a three-mile convoy. The tanks, personnel carriers and stolen Kuwaiti cars had been heading for the Iraqi border. Once the column had been spotted, American aircraft had targeted the front and rear first. Then what had become an enormous traffic jam would be bombed relentlessly for hours. An estimated 1,500 vehicles were annihilated. Reports of the death toll ranged from a few hundred to several thousand. How many survived has never been established. Some condemned the attack as a shot in the back and a violation of the Geneva Convention. Others argued that the convoy had been heavily armed and posed a threat to Allied troops. Either way, the highway of death ranks as one of the most significant moments of the First Gulf War. A vast effort to clear the Basra Road involved British Royal Engineers. Among the first to drive through were Arab coalition allies given the honor of liberating Kuwait. In six weeks, almost a million people from more than 30 countries had evicted Saddam Hussein, the largest international military effort since the Second World War was over. It had cost the lives of 47 members of the British forces and 392 across the coalition. Estimates of Iraqi deaths vary sharply. The Imperial War Museum suggests that 20 to 35,000 Iraqi soldiers died. Estimates for the number of civilians killed range from thousands to hundreds of thousands. Iraq was left isolated and economically ruined. Saddam Hussein retained power for a further 12 years. It would take another war in the Gulf to finally remove him. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.